In the first debate, we have a reflection on the transition from the 19th century to the 20th century, impacts of World War I, and how to restore what was lost. Here we have two theories. One was realism, a perception of the nature of that order aimed at understanding it in terms of three concepts, anarchy, sovereignty, and balance of power. Anarchy allowed states to protect the freedom of their citizens and thrive in their environment. We had the idea of sovereignty, the bureaucratic apparatus with the legitimacy to use force to defend the autonomy of that territory and that culture. And the balance of power was the dynamic that allowed that, even if circumstances changed, the different coalitions would always remain in the process if they contained the expansion of one another, so that the autonomy of most countries would never be lost. That was classical realism. In contrast to it, we have liberalism, a perception of the European order deeply anchored in the value that freedom had for European culture and the importance of creating institutions that could preserve that freedom. So it was thought about how to project the continuity of the European order into the future, expanding the capacity of international law, increasing the transparency of public opinion, developing trade as a vehicle to generate interdependence between countries in order to make war less likely. This debate with the historical trajectory followed after the First World War, with the crisis of 29, the rise of fascism, and the emergence of the the Second World War makes liberalism seem far from reality. So with this post-Second World War context, we have a scenario that looks like realism had more ability to explain those events than liberalism. We started to have a more methodological discussion that takes place from the moment the US becomes more relevant in terms of intellectual production. Faced with this transition, the discipline of international relations itself also needs to undergo a transformation as the other social sciences are also changing. This is related to the need to reformulate classical thinking and adapt it to the formal models of the exact sciences that were gaining a lot of credibility in the American academia. In this scenario, failing to adapt to these reformulations of objectively systematizing, creating testable hypotheses, and creating models with a degree of measurability to be effectively considered a science was something that would harm their ability to develop a science with autonomy and credibility. Other forms of knowledge could arise and replace you. In the 50s, we have a transformation in which we have scientific authors who engage in the transformations of rethinking the classic concept of realism more precisely. And we have the historical authors who look to history to think about science. As we go through this process and the discipline engages in this transformation, we also have criticisms of realism. Realism is born as a reflection to explain a concept of war and the intellectual heritage used from authors who lived in the context of war. Thus, the theory is linked to the idea of the need for survival and violence as a fundamental element in decision-making. But the transformations, especially in the 70s, will make other elements fundamental in the point of view of reflection on the decision-making of the great powers. In the 70s, the Cold War changed considerably. The variables that need to be managed by these countries and the problems experienced by them become more oriented towards the economic order. The American economy is slowing down as a result of actions to build institutions with the objective of reforming a large part of the international system. This is beginning to have an impact on the American economy and a resentment on the part of American society since the U.S. is paying the cost of that process. In this, the Nixon government devalued the currency for the first time since World War II. This devaluation is very symptomatic because the monetary system of the international system was anchored in that currency. Once the American currency, which was the anchor of the entire international system, loses stability, a whole set of problems becomes possible from that moment on. Certain situations were caused by this transition in which the dollar's ability to operate as an anchor of the international financial system was lost. Another set of transformations is related to the oil crisis because this generated a large amount of money to lend to third world countries, which generated a debt crisis in the 80s. The point to be highlighted is that the fundamental concerns of the management of the international system by the powers changed radically from that moment on. Realism has no answers to these changes. It does not provide theories to help the decision maker recognize what kind of action should be taken. Thus, we have other alternatives to realism, which 
focus on economic issues and the consequences of economic issues for the future of the international system, we started to have a debate between three distinct paradigms, neorealism, neoliberalism, and neo-Marxism. In this third debate, the reflection on the international system is projected in three different directions. Neorealism talks about the relationship between institutions and hegemony, in which institutions function as part of a power project. Once the power project falls apart, the institution loses its importance. Neoliberals produce a theory about the different states' interests, about the possibility of cooperation, and the observation that a large part of the contemporary international system is formed by cooperation processes. If we don't have a theory that explains cooperation, we would be ignoring most events. And we have neo-Marxism, which tries to turn this set of new incidents into a theory to count on a hegemonic crisis and what would need to be done to have stability in the international system. Marxism has not managed to build a discussion about the importance of the role of the state that fits the demand for reflection on international relations. Marxism focuses on the idea that social conflict arises from the dynamics of production and not from the dynamics of the relationship between states. This interparadigmatic debate, in a way, converge on an integration. Neorealism and neoliberalism, from a certain point onwards, come to such a point where they do not have the same hypothesis hypothesis, so they manage to become almost the same. Liberalism incorporates the two main concepts of the realist tradition, a predominance of anarchy and the state as a central actor. Realism accepts the idea that we cannot necessarily assume that the only kind of gain the state seeks in the system is survival. States have different types of preferences, thus we have a new intellectual consensus about what the nature of the object is and how it should be studied. That consensus is rationalism. Within rationalism, the only object of research properly is to generate hypotheses about which gains are predominant in the strategy of a given state, if at any time the state is more sensitive to relative gains or absolute gains. When it is more focused on absolute gains, we are more likely to have cooperation. When a state is more sensitive to relative gains, it is more difficult to generate guarantees that enable it to have cooperation, since the state will be more concerned with what the others are earning. In the 90s, we had a vast set of transformations, not only focused on reflection on hegemony, but also reflections focused on the extent to which the thoughts that have been funneling helps us to understand the types of challenges and rules that the international system needs to go through in order to have stability, something radically different from what these theories are prepared to explain. In the 90s, violence increased in the international system, but inter state violence diminishes. Those theories were not prepared to explain this. It is necessary to think about the sources and consequences of this violence in a different way from international relations theories, because this series thought about state decision making. Here the victim of this violence is not necessarily the state. The transition that the international system is going through generates a set of contradictions that traditional international relations theories have difficulty dealing with. Since the Second World War, the objective of knowledge has been to be an instrument of state power. Therefore, we have a dilemma between the objective of this knowledge, which is to manage the state, enabling the state to take effective action, strategies, and the universe of threats that are not imposed only on the state. Sometimes the state is no longer the source of security, as it can even be a source of threat to certain groups. We have circumstances in which the very dynamics of governance can no longer pass through the national interest because the nature of these threats cannot be contained at the border. The theories of international relations had an objective to produce a useful knowledge to promote the national interest. When the sources of global instability do not translate into national interest strategies, we have an intellectual dilemma that is difficult to deal with. Here we have a growing gap that starts to get bigger and bigger between the dilemmas that a set of intellectuals, activists, and academics are increasingly starting to work 
worry about and the kind of answers that international relations can provide. So as this gap grows, we have a larger group of authors resorting to other intellectual resources outside of international relations. We have a transformation that brings the importance of rethinking the role of culture, sociology and identity in understanding the world and how to generate responses to it. From the end of the 70s and beginning of the 80s, we have new ways of thinking in international relations. Therefore, we have a new tension between authors concerned with the state, with science, with the national interest, and authors who seek to bring this reflection on culture and identity, undergoing such transformations that it is necessary to think of new ways to understand the nature of the conflicts of that period and create adequate responses to them. So we have the reflexive authors. Here we have a huge range of authors who think very differently. We have authors who try to appropriate a critical theory supported by the contributions of the Frankfurt School. We have the introduction of a reflection based on feminism. We have post-colonial authors and more. These authors will try to build an opposition between rigor and relevance. The world changed very profoundly after the 90s, mainly because the nature of violence changed. Thus, the mechanisms needed to manage violence also needed to change. So either we remain with a type of theory created and constructed to think about the problem of the state, which would be adequate if the violence of the international system remained as violence produced by states against states, or we adapt to a universe of transformations where violence has increased but violence between states has decreased. Therefore, we have to understand what this new violence is, what impact it can have, and how to manage the consequences of its production and reproduction. Thank you for watching.